Welcome to Moving Medicine, a podcast by the American Medical Association. Today's episode is produced in collaboration with the Permanente Docs Chat Podcast. The host, Dr. Alex McDonald, talks with AMA President-elect Dr. Bobby McCamala about the nation's overdose epidemic. Dr. McCamala is an otolaryngologist at his solo practice in Michigan and serves as chair of the AMA Substance Use and Pain Care Task Force. They'll discuss the latest data, system-wide steps to create change, and clinical strategies that can help physicians balance pain management with addiction prevention. Here's Dr. McDonald. Welcome, everyone, to today's Permanente Docs Chat. I am your host, as always, Alex McDonald. I practice family and sports medicine here in Fontana, California. Uh, and this week, uh, we are joined uh, with Dr. Uh, Bobby uh, Mukamala, who is uh, president-elect of the, excuse me, vice, vice chair, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, of the American Medical Association. <laughs> and he's also the chair of the Substance Use and Pain Care Task Force, uh, and really a very strong voice on evidence-based policies to really uh, c- curtail the opioid crisis. So, uh, <laughs> Bobby, thank you for joining us. I apologize. I butchered your last name. Not at all. It happens all the time, Alex. It's Mukamala, but, uh, but no, no problem. Mukamala. All right. I'll try and get that right. I'll practice that a couple no, times. Bobby's just fine. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have questions, uh, please please drop those into the Q and A box. Uh, we'll try to get to those as many of those as we can live. Um, there are um, uh, there these are short and high yields, so we really want to kind of get those questions in early. Um, so, so Bobby, let's start by telling us kind of who you are and, and what you do. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Um, uh, I'm a private practice otolaryngologist here in Flint, Michigan. It's the town that uh, that my parents moved to from India back in 1970. And I share this home office and my office with my wife, Nita, who's an OBGYN, sort of an odd combination of ENT and OBGYN. But uh, but as you mentioned, I'm, I'm serving as uh, president-elect of the American Medical Association. But before that position, um, I had the honor of serving as chair and continue to serve as chair of our work related to substance use disorder and pain care. Um, and it, you know, a lot of people sort of question why is a otolaryngologist sort of in this role as uh, as chair of this work related to substance use disorder. And I think some of that reason was that you know many years ago I got my X waiver um, to uh, prescribe buprenorphine, and I did that just because you know a lot of our advocacy work is around um, pain control and substance use disorder management as we started to see our country going in the wrong direction. And I just didn't feel comfortable as a leader within the AMA you know, saying you should do this, you should get your X waiver, not knowing what that was like to do it myself. So, so I got my X waiver, I did it online and, uh, and, and, and did the testing and got my X waiver. And I think that got the attention of folks within the AMA saying, Hey, you know, non-pain physicians sort of embracing this work and the collective group of physicians embracing this work is how we will move this in the right direction. So now that's how an otolaryngologist gets to uh, chair this work at the AMA. Great. No, and and I love that putting kind of putting your money where your mouth is, so to speak, or or leading by example, um, is I think is so important. And, and as a physician, especially, and a, and a a leader, uh, in the leadership role, um, that's so valuable. So so thank you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, let's let's start by kind of telling us kind of where we are right now with sort of the the opioid crisis, and you know there is is some some glimmers of of, of good news this year. We are still past a hundred thousand uh, overdose overdose death this year. Um, but can you talk about kind of where we are in the opioid crisis, and and are we making progress? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, absolutely. The latest news um, is great. Um, you know, with with fewer deaths, approximately ten thousand fewer deaths. Clearly, we're we're going in the right direction. What's a little interesting about the latest data is that we're still not sure why. Right? Is this because of efforts? Is it because of conversations like this? Is it because of, of uh, naloxone? Um, is it because we are decreasing the the amount of um, illicit substances that are coming into this country? Is it better treatment? We don't know yet. But you know, what I would say is that we'll take it. Right, that's ten thousand more people that are alive today than uh, than than would have been had we not had this um, change in trajectory, and so where we are is is a step in the right direction, but there's still a a ton of preventable deaths um, related to opioids, and so you know the first thing to do is sort of um, we have an obligation to do better, right? We shouldn't just say okay, we're going in the right direction, we can take our foot off the gas. We need to continue in this work because otherwise, especially when we don't know why, this could go easily in the wrong direction, right? Next year, statistics could be worse. 
And then the other thing is that, you know, the majority of these deaths, the vast majority of these deaths, 80% are due to illicit fentanyl. I mean, that's been the case for years, right? And, and now, in, in addition to that, cocaine and methamphetamine sort of su uh, surpassing prescription opioids as far as the, the cause of these deaths. And it's been that way now for, for many years. But yet the focus seems to continue to be on prescription opioids. There's still so many programs and hospitals across the country sort of looking at prescription opioids and trying to sort of restrict how many opioids we write for our patients. And there's a consequence to that, right? So patients with real pain are suffering with pain. That's why our task force that used to be sort of pain management and substance use disorder separately is yep. actually the substance use disorder and pain care task force. So what we do over here to sort of try to decrease the burden of substance use disorder isn't leaving people out in the cold, so to speak, as far as their pain management goes. And so that's why it's critical to have that conversation in the same room so we know what the consequences of those things are. Yeah, that is such a great point regarding, you know, we there's so much emphasis, especially for us as physicians to, you know, prescribe for opioids and to minimize even initial refills or no, don't even start it. But the fact that so much of this is really coming from sort of the least illicit use and the, and the use disorder um uh, kind of, I don't want to say population, but, but that being the bigger, bigger challenge, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then to your point also about sort of the unintended consequences, you know, I, I've, one of my colleagues here who, pra who practices hospice and palliative medicine is having a trouble getting opioids for his patients who are on hospice and palliative. Um, and so we're having to struggle with, we sort of have a limited supply of these medications um, because of sort of manufacturing restrictions. Um, and now we're having to sort of choose, okay, can we can we give these medications for, for kind of acute pain? Do we have to save them for those who have, you know, palliative and hospice? And it, it brings up a lot of ethical challenges for the, those of us who, who practice on the front lines. Yeah, absolutely. It's just so interesting that you know, there was a time and there was litigation associated with pharmaceutical companies sort of, you know, pushing opioids, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember people coming to my office when I first started my practice talking about the latest narcotic pain medication for post-tonsillectomy pain, right? A, a really rough procedure to recover yeah. from and talking about how the opioids that they have aren't addictive. Right? And, and now we know how wrong that was. And so to go from that point to now, for those patients that are in pain, for those same post tonsillectomy patients to have to go to three different pharmacies in the Flint area post op, mm -hmm. trying to get a prescription filled and not having it be in stock because we use a liquid narcotic pain medication for adults after tonsillectomy. Mm -hmm. And it's just really hard to find. And so now they're back to crushing tablets and things like that. And so we, we've con gone from one bad situation to another bad situation where patients with pain you know, acute pain, post-surgical pain are struggling in the way that you described, in addition to people with chronic pain. And, and having to ration that is just not where we we should be, right? And that's exactly where, where people will seek other, I mean, pain doesn't just go away if you think it away, right? I mean, so it's something that, that needs treatment, particularly acute pain. And so in that situation, people will um, oftentimes use illicit substances to control right. that real pain. And that's not at all where we want to go. Yeah. And I guess that's sort of my next question is how much by by limiting kind of the, the spigot on this side, how much are we kind of causing the flood over here? Um, and you mentioned, you, can you delve into that, that statistic a little bit more that the kind of 80 percent of illicit or excuse me, that that drug overdose are due to illicit uh, you know, mm -hmm. street drug use? Is that correct? Yep, absolutely. Yep. And so illicit fentanyl. Fentanyl. is the number one cause of that, right? And and so then there's also, you know, there's cocaine, there's methamphetamine, other sort of smaller segments, but, you know, in xylazine. And so, I mean, it just seems like every year our pain care task force is always sort of looking at what's coming around the corner into our communities, right? What can we anticipate? And it's, it's, it's never a dull moment, unfortunately, because it's constantly changing what's laced with what, because this isn't, again, something that's getting dispensed 30 tablets in a, in a prescription, you know, cup that you're getting at the pharmacy. This is anybody's guess about what's 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 happening in these communities. Right. And so right. it is illicit substances, but not necessarily something that with, with predictability, like, OK, if it's this color pill, it's going to be, you know, this percentage. Rainbow fentanyl is something that was was on the streets that uh, that's still on the streets that you, who knows how much fentanyl is in this stuff. And that's why, you know, people that are trying their best to sort of, you know, recover from their substance use disorder and then have a relapse and then go out and, and use something are oftentimes at the highest risk of dying and overdosing from that because they just don't know what they're getting. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a 
that's something I don't think we realize necessarily specifically those those of us who don't work kind of in in this realm in our everyday work. Again, as a family physician, I treat patients with with pain and and chronic pain. And I do use some opioids, but I, I don't really get a lot of exposure to to the use disorder world and this in, in the kind of the ramifications downstream. Medicine doesn't stand still, and at the AMA, neither do we. AMA members are physicians like you who are shaping the future of medicine. Become a member today and join the movement. Visit ama-assn.org slash movingmedicine. You know, and, and I think because of some of this, a lot of a lot of people, and some people argue that the the opioid crisis really represents a, a failure of the healthcare system. I mean, to, not to put too strong a point on it, and and do you, do you agree with that? And 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 what does that mean for us as a physicians regarding how we approach, you know, treatment, uh, patient education, and just effective pain management? Yeah, I guess I would say in short that I, I disagree. I would say that okay. it's multifactorial, as we say in medicine, right? So it's an epidemic with many causes. And, mm -hmm. and the healthcare system is sort of a convenient scapegoat sometimes. And, and But we need to look at particular elements to identify what needs to change. And sure, you know, as physicians, we've learned a lot in the past. You know, it used to be when I was in my training, every person that got their tonsils taken out got a prescription for Tylenol with codeine elixir, regardless of age, mm -hmm. right? And with, with a bunch of refills. Now I know that if they're under 18, Tylenol and Motrin work just as well. And so we sort of avoid narcotic medication. And even those adults, um, if for every surgical procedure, we've realized that, you know, dispensing 30 with three refills, the average person takes less than a third of that. And so that sits in a medicine cabinet. And so there is a responsibility for healthcare to sort of be introspective, see what it is that we're, we're doing and what needs to change based on data. But beyond that, you know, we're just one part of the system. Right. And insurers are another big part of that system. And things like prior authorization that just leads to delay and, and denial of care. You know, every person listening today knows how hard it is to find care when somebody needs it. Right. The, the premium dollars that we spend that are just tightly held by insurance companies to delay and deny that care. And that's why it's critical that we sort of, you know, we continue to push and say, look, if physical therapy is something that's going to be useful for this patient to deal with their pain, and that physical therapy is something that is either denied or something that is limited and, you know, how often they can get it or for the duration that they can get it, that's not serving this patient well, right? That pain is real. And if the only other alternative is an opioid medication that we want to avoid, right? then don't have us go through the, the hurdle of prior authorization to do what's best for that patient. And that's what we see so much that the, you know, the, the, the prior authorization burden in healthcare in general, but particularly as it relates to, to management of somebody's pain is something that really is a, is a headwind um, in going the direction that we want to go, which is to take better care of these patients. Yeah. No, in in your point regarding sort of just the the opioids being one one tool in the toolbox um regarding the myriad of different sort of treatment op options we have for both both acute and chronic pain. Um I always tell patients that when I am prescribing an opioid, I kind of go through all the risks and benefits and I say, look, this is this is part of a comprehensive pain management pain management strategy. We need you on your SNRI. We need you on, you know, motion and Tylenol kind of as first line. We need you on, you know, perhaps really kind of a some kind of a, a neuroleptic med medication. We need you on physical therapy and, and really making sure that we are using all the tools in our toolbox versus sort of just one, which can obviously have all these downstream consequences. And I, yeah. I, I think the word is getting out to physicians. Um, but as you said, there's all these barriers to really making sure we kind of focus on 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 non non opioids as part of a comprehensive approach. Absolutely. Like when when the toolbox that's right in front of us that's unlocked has a Phillips set and a regular screwdriver, but what we need is a hex wrench and it's in a locked toolbox over there, that doesn't do us much good, right? right. And so the same way if if prescribing opioids is something that we can do, but prescribing physical therapy or other sort of pain care for those patients with chronic pain, a procedure, if that's something that has a hurdle to get to, right? And it's going to take months, this patient's in pain, right? It's not, it's not, it's not like a, a crooked nose that I deal with, right? Somebody that's been stuffy and can't breathe through the left side of their nose for years. Okay. You know, prior auth isn't great for them either, but it's not going to have the consequences of prior auth for somebody that is dealing with acute pain or chronic pain mm -hmm. that is now waiting to get the appropriate procedure because of the burden of prior authorization. That's just not right. Yep. No, I, I completely agree with you. I completely agree with you.
You mentioned sort of several different things, which which may be kind of helping kind of curtail this these opioid crisis and the over deaths. And I think one of the biggest things right now that's that's becoming more commonplace is the the use and availability of naloxone um, as as sort of a rescue medication for patients who may be overdosed. You can get it some places without a prescription. Um, do do we think this is working? Do you think that's a piece of the puzzle? And uh, do we see that maybe some people might see that as sort of a, a safety net and say, oh, well, it's not as big a deal because you can just take naloxone if you if you have problems or if you take too much. Um, and how should sort of physicians begin to sort of address some of that concern? Um, I see this a lot in my my. Um, my my HIV population or patients who are high risk of HIV, you know, they just want to take you know pre exposure prophylaxis and then they don't use you know contraception and, and have have a higher risk of contracting HIV. Um, uh, so it's kind of one one example. Do we are we worried about that in some respects or or is that we're not quite that there yet? Yeah, it, it, I, I guess I, I I'm not worried about that because okay. naloxone. I mean, it's not it's not a safety net. I mean, it's an evidence based you know, time-tested medication that saves that saved hundreds of thousands of lives over the past decades. And so the, the myth of reliance on naloxone is, is this kind of like the same myth that, you know, seat belts encourage risky driving, right? right. Like I'm, yep. I'm gonna I'm gonna drive poorly because I've got a seatbelt. And so I mean all physicians should offer a prescription for naloxone. I mean you don't even need it now because it's over the counter. Exactly. Um and, and that's a wonderful development. I guess one side note there is that it's over the counter, but at 50 bucks a packet. Right. right. It's prohibitive for a lot of people. And I know there's a lot of community programs um, to do that, but it sure would be nice to see that that price come down. But for example, at AMA headquarters in, in D.C., um, where we have our advocacy office, we have naloxone available on every floor there at the AMA building. Um, mm -hmm. And you know we haven't had to use it. There hasn't been an overdose at the building, but Union Station is literally a few buildings down the road. And so, I mean, down the street. And so if it's, you know, if it's available, hopefully we'll never need it, uh, but it's it's good to have it. Just like you know, we, you go to any airport, right? And, and you'll see the uh, the defibrillators. Yep. I mean, you, you, it's just the fact that we had defibrillators. We were having people sort of figure out how to shock people back into a normal rhythm at the same time where we said, this nasal spray is going to be prescription only, right? And I think it's that kind of argument that got it to be over the counter, where yep. if we can shock people out of an arrhythmia, you can yep. certainly spray them up the nose with the naloxone if they're having an overdose. And so, you know, but, but getting back to the, the the safety net thought and the inadvertent sort of encouraging use um, by having it be available, readily available. I mean, I would say that, you know, does does having an EpiPen available make somebody with a peanut allergy say, I'm just going to have that peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? They just don't do that, right? right? There's no way they would do that. And so in the same way, having Narcan isn't going to make somebody with a substance use disorder, right? An addiction, just say, oh, I'm just going to take it because I know I've got Narcan. It's good to have it for sure. Yep. But this isn't something that's like a a, a, a choice. Um, mm -hmm. This is something that's a medical condition, right? This is this is an addiction. And so it's, it's the dependence that needs to be treated. And I, and I don't want us to get too hung up in thinking that that the, having the naloxone available is going to somehow make them less likely to pursue a solution. You know, we, we, there's a lot of examples now in emergency departments where, yes, we will save their life with naloxone and pray that we do. Mm -hmm. But instead of just sending them out the door, let us get them hooked up with something like buprenorphine treatment, right? Get them plugged into a clinic, hand them off that warm handoff um, to, to the next person to receive them. So it doesn't become a revolving door of just saving their life with naloxone until we can't. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's sort of, you know, teaching them to fish versus giving them a fish um, is the example I use a lot of times with my patients wanting to make sure that we give them the tools that they can then be successful and healthy and don't end up back in the emergency room or wherever they may end up being. Yep, absolutely. Do you, of all sort of the the strategies which are currently being implemented to combat the opioid, opioid addiction and, and the epidemic of over, overdose, what, what, what are sort of the most promising? Um, I know you mentioned we don't really know what's working and what's not working because we're just trying trying all these different things. But what kind of has the most evidence and and what are you most optimistic about? Yeah, um, I guess what I would say is we, we know what works um, in these defined cases where we have studies to, to show that things like like harm reduction strategies, right? We have data about that. What we don't know is what we were referencing earlier is that what what caused this major drop across the country yeah. in, in all these states. And so that's what that needs investigation. But I really like this question because, you know, the actions that the AMA task force recommends are actually the ones that that some states and medical schools and departments of insurance are actually doing today. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we don't, 
need innovation so much as we need action, right? We, we need, you know, the states to continue to remove barriers to, to care for patients with pain and those with mental illness or substance use disorder. We need medical schools to sort of embed that comprehensive pain care as part of the curriculum and, and substance use disorder treatment um, training into the curricula. Um, and, and we need enforcement of, of current laws, right? We have some laws in the books, but we need you know, Im implementation and enforcement of those laws, things like we mentioned, like like prior authorization and, uh, and and sort of decreasing those barriers. And then, you know, for for primary care and other specialties, you know, if we can start treating a, a few patients for an opioid, the opioid use disorder, we should do that. You know, the evidence shows that buprenorphine works and that and, and the treatment um, is is improved by that. But, you know, again, like I mentioned earlier, we used to have to get an X waiver. And we right. don't need to do that anymore, right? Just like the generation ago when, when primary care doctors a while ago were sort of hesitant to start patients on an antidepressant because it's mm -hmm. like, ah, you know, there's something new. I'm not sure about that. Now we do it routinely, right? We don't right. even think twice about it. In the same way, we need to get to that comfort level treating somebody that we can recognize based on the, you know, the, the statistics that we see on our EHR that comes up about, you know, the opioids that they're using and their history because we know them better than, than, than the emergency room physician. We know who's at risk and, and building up the comfort of the primary care physician base to take care of our patients with that condition, just like we built up that base to take care of mental illness and depression a generation ago. That's when we really start to, to, to move in the right direction with this. Yeah, that th as a primary care doctor, thank you. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, this is something that I have had a little bit of training on. Um, but I mean, I don't know, you, you've inspired me to, to learn more and to get more involved here, because I think you're absolutely right. We we need, um, you know, as, as kind of the gateway to the to the healthcare industry, you know, primary care is can be so powerful in terms of just stopping a stopping a problem before it becomes becomes greater. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, just, just demystifying it, right? Yeah. When all of a sudden we need an X waiver to be able to use this medicine, buprenorphine, it's like, eh, you know, I'm not sure about that. It's a lot of hours of CME. It must be dangerous. Right. And now that that's gone, it's something that we should be comfortable doing, right? And so many states have, you know, CME related to pain care and substance use disorder already that we just need to sort of eliminate the stigma of, mm -hmm. of the medication and use it um, in a way that's actually going to help us. Medicine doesn't stand still, and neither do we. AMA members don't just keep up with medicine, they shape its future. Help move medicine, join the movement. Visit ama-assn.org slash moving medicine. Um, I, I have a, some colleagues in my office who, in primary care, who basically, because of some of these barriers and, and you know, challenges and difficulty dealing with opioids is in terms of prescriptions and availability. They basically just say, I'm not prescribing opioids, right? It's like, it's just not, it's not safe. I'm not going to do it. Um, what, what would you say to those physicians? Yeah. You know, so if for, especially for people that have a substance use disorder or, or pain issue, right. In particular. So they're coming in with chronic pain up until this point, they had a source of medication for that pain. And it was something that they had, you know, with their physician agreed to do. And now all of a sudden that physician retires, new physician comes in and says exactly what you just said. You know, I'm not comfortable with that. There's somebody's going to be looking at the numbers that I prescribe and the, and the scrutiny. I just don't want to deal with it. Yep. Okay. So the physician makes that decision. The pain hasn't gone away. Mm -hmm. Right. And so now this patient is scrambling and in a town like mine, where we don't have enough physicians for the population we have, it is going to be extraordinarily difficult for that patient to be able to find a physician, let alone find a physician that's comfortable helping them manage that pain, right? And, and so that's why it's critical that we sort of, you know, that we raise the level of conversation within the physician community, but also resources, because even if that physician says, okay, you know, I understand, but I, I did this, I, I, I did this work um, and I think that this is something that should be managed with a non-opioid treatment. So let's do this. And then boom, prior authorization. Yeah. Right? Can't execute the plan that this physician and this patient came up with together. And that still leaves them as if the physician didn't ever prescribe it in the first place. Right. Yeah. And, and so that it's just, these, these are the barriers, both sort of with our own comfort level with this diagnosis. And then the hurdles that we have to climb over, even when we have the comfort to treat that diagnosis, dealing with things like prior authorization. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, this has been such a phenomenal conversation. We could go on and on. And I really appreciate your your insight and your kind of nuanced approach here because there's there's so many shades of gray and it's not all about 
one thing or the other. And it's really about doing what's best for the patient. And so I I really appreciate all the work that you are doing and the AMA is doing, because I think this is this is hard and there's not easy solutions. Um, but we have to kind of all be in this together, as you, yeah, as you think- mentioned kind of at the beginning. Yeah, the the stigma associated with this um, lives on. You know, when we see a patient that's blue from an anaphylactic reaction, right? We have no issue at all jumping in and doing what we need to do to control that anaphylaxis. When we see a patient that's blue from an opioid overdose, all of a sudden the stigma becomes this barrier. And we really need to do a good job of not just us, but law enforcement, our communities, changing the stigma. So the blue patient from, from anaphylaxis isn't seen any differently than the blue patient from an overdose. Wonderful. That's a great, great uh, insights to end on. So thank you so much, Dr. Mukamala. I really appreciate your time and energy. Absolutely. No problem, Alex. Subscribe to the Permanente Docs Chat podcast to never miss an episode and register to take part in upcoming live chats. Visit permanente.org slash AMA Docs Chat.